Hello, friends. Welcome back to Love Wrestling. Spencer here with another one of my favorite guests that I've had on the show. I feel like I say that a lot, but I am so very lucky. I get to chat to a lot of great people in professional wrestling, a lot of my favorite professional wrestlers, and the case again today, Ravenous Randy Myers, your weirdo hero, the punk hunk, joining me again. Man, it's great to talk to you. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Hey, the last time you and I chatted, we were right at the start of this whole COVID pandemic. Everybody, I think, was still pretty optimistic that you could get out of this in a couple of months and we would be back to normal. But here we are. It's middle of November and things still aren't back to the proverbial normal. We're in the new normal. But how are you doing over on your end, friend? I don't think I ever knew what normal was to begin with. So <laughs> I'm used to whatever weird they can throw at me. You know, it seems like seems like you like said things are changing all the time but i'm doing well i'm holding it together and i'm still optimistic that you know if we do things right we can get through this shorter rather than longer 110 percent, man and you've been doing everything you can to keep yourself busy throughout it despite the fact that professional wrestling isn't going full force with any of the promotions that you would consider home from the last time we chatted but you're getting back into comedy you're getting back into sort of the artistic side of things that you had done before but maybe you've taken a little bit more of a pronounced role right now how's it been for you getting your feet uh reacquainted with getting into the world of stand-up and that sort of thing it's been really nice. This is the first time, like last year on my birthday, which is November 26th, which is just around the corner, I gave myself the present of finally like committing to doing stand-up kind of more weekly and stuff like that, almost like as many shows as I could get to happen in between my wrestling gigs. And then mm-hmm. COVID happened, and then wrestling went away, but stand-up seems to have like been able to find a way to like still happen because it's you can do it socially distance you can have small like a very small amount of people there you don't need to work one-on-one there's no sweat yeah. getting in my mouth all those kind of things so <laughs> it's been really great and it's like to have an outlet and a place that i can still like perform and connect with a crowd uh it's it's awesome and i've taken this opportunity to do something that i wouldn't have been able to do full blast like i with wrestling on board right so I wouldn't be able to take Friday or Saturday shows. I would always be kind of juggling between two Mm -hmm. things. And then I'm kind of like all or nothing. I like to commit and sink my teeth into something. Yeah. So right now I've got the opportunity to do that. So I'm taking advantage. How different is it for you to prepare for both professional wrestling and then the stand-up side of things? You'd have to assume that there's a lot of crossover. There's not a lot of difference in you, whether you're chatting casually, whether you're in the professional wrestling ring. But do you prepare differently? Is it a bit of a different experience as far as the crowd goes? Or is it just, I'm Randy Myers, take me as I leave me, wherever I may be? Well, yeah, at the beginning, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to, like, what I wanted to sell or how I wanted to sell that to the audience. But then Mm -hmm. I realized I've been... I've been selling something for a long time and I'm happy with, with what I have to give. And so I just, like you said, brought ravenous Randy full tilt to the stage, love it or leave it. And most people have loved it. One guy walked out in the middle of a show, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's you happened know, to everybody <laughs> before. Yeah, <but> <laughs> It's happened to everybody before. I'm certain oh, there are totally, people uh, who have listened to my interviews before and been like, what the hell is that guy doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But you can't see them. That's the great thing about a podcast. You can't physically see them walk out right in front of you. <laughs> like, oh, that, I'm not their cup of tea. But you know what? I like green tea with some honey, and I'm not a fan of coffee. So you know what I mean? We got to each have our own flavor. <laughs> Exactly, man. It's kind of nice that you're getting back into it because one of my first experiences that I had with you was the short film that you did a couple of years back, The Weirdo Hero. I went back and rewatched it, man. And it's just, again, just such a cool piece of art, not just a film, especially when you sort of read into, you know, the interviews that you guys had done, whether it's yourself, whether it's the production team behind it and how much it personally meant to you guys. So maybe just give a bit of a brief background if you can on The Weirdo Hero and then uh, how it affected you and why it meant so much to you. Well, it came to me at a like a, a time where I was first like really coming to terms with my depression and my mental health issues that I'd been struggling with all along. And they just were like kept coming up and were becoming such a major block in all forms of my life that I just went into the ring and I thought it was time that I was honest with the fans and talked to them about my depression. And then the outreach from that was overwhelming. I was so scared to go out there and be 
true and be that vulnerable and show a pain other than physical inside the mm -hmm. wrestling ring. And like I said, the outreach was like beyond what I could have ever expected. I wasn't looking for any cheers or anything like that in that yeah. moment. You know, I'm always looking for like, what's the big pop you can get in wrestling, but this was the initial sort of short term reaction to it. For sure. Exactly. And even that, like, that's not what I was looking for. This was just me wanting to connect and be honest with some people that had always been there for me, which in this case was my fans. Mm -hmm. um, and then a um, fellow wrestler came to me and he told me that he too was suffering kind of silently with depression and that he would like to talk to me about this. And so we met at Denny's a couple times over some green tea with honey. And, <laughs> and then we talked about our kind of came forward with our issues to each other. His name's Derek Hurd. He wrestles under the name MR2. And then he had stepped away from the ring and he was interested in maybe making a project together. So we pitched this idea, this rough idea of a story about a wrestler who was suffering with depression. And then we kind of like tinkered with that, pitched it to a couple different people. Finally, we got a guy by the name of Ryan Curtis to come on board. We got, we crowdfunded it through Indiegogo and the outreach through that again was like, I, I, I didn't expect it to be funded so quickly or maybe even be funded at all. But mm -hmm. like the fans were great and we had people like pay a thousand dollars to be part of the film. And I think her performance, she plays the nurse at the end, I think is one of the most like her name's Phyllis and she, she destroyed. She was great. Um, yeah. So it's, a, yeah, it's a short film that you can find on YouTube. Sorry, that was a little long winded, but the, uh, just a short film you can find on YouTube. That's very loosely based around my struggle with depression and kind of overcoming self-doubt and just acceptance of who you really are and mm -hmm. as, whole, as a whole. Yeah. It's pretty cool to hear because you hear about the positive response you're even telling me with the Indiegogo and all of that sort of stuff prior to the film, but going through and reading the reviews of it and hearing the response from some of the professional wrestlers and people involved in the scene afterwards, how much does that mean to you? Do you think you were able to accomplish your goal of really bringing it to an industry that, you know, now maybe even doesn't have the best reputation? Nonetheless, I would have to assume back when you decided to make the film. Yeah. Um, like it was just kind of, it was to show sensitivity within professional wrestling both to outside of professional wrestling and to kind of within professional wrestling because it is seen mm -hmm. as something where we're grunting and we're sweating and we're angry all the time so it was to show another side of wrestling to people who maybe have never seen that before whether they be in wrestling or outside of wrestling and to have the outreach i got from fans and from other wrestlers as well was like not something i expected i wanted to just kind of make something truthful and i've always been a big fan of movies and always had it on my bucket list to make a movie. So when this opportunity came and I'm by no means am I an actor, but I can play myself. And so I, I played <laughs> myself to my, the best of my ability and was as vulnerable as I could be on the screen. And I think that that was able to reach out and touch some people. And yeah, it, the goal as cheesy as it was, was to like, if it helped one person kind of understand that they weren't alone or that they weren't, yeah, just struggling for no reason that there was going to be hope at the end of the tunnel. Um, that's what I was looking for. And I got more than one person who patted me on the back. So, and said it helped them. So that's awesome. Like I said, not looking for those pats or those pops, but looking for the, see if I can make somebody smile or be more able to accept themselves. Absolutely. And it seems like there's a lot of crossover between, again, that and your professional wrestling. Where does that come from? Where does that desire come from? Is it just your own personal struggles with mental health? Was there like some sort of, for lack of a better way to put it, like a come to Jesus moment where you said, this is sort of my goal in life and this is what I want to do? Or where do you find your motivation as far as that goes? It's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't, it's inside. There's just something that's always been inside of me. And I didn't know what that was for a long time. So I guess there was like that coming to Jesus moment or whatever you want to call Flying it. Flying like spaghetti that. monster. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, coming to Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're just, and they were kind of piece by piece. It wasn't, I guess, just one giant moment, but it was just, I was in front of a crowd for so long, throwing things kind of at the wall and trying to put on these different personas and trying to see what connected with the crowd and then, kind of when I stripped all that away and gave my real self after what, 15 years of wrestling. And that, that was the thing that they wanted. And the thing I was trying to hide all these years behind smoke and mirrors was the thing that I was 
getting the most appreciation for and getting the connection I was always looking for, like mm -hmm. making the, being the wrestler that I needed when I was young, being that person that I didn't see necessarily up on the wrestling screen, but, or often represented at least. And it was those shining moments within wrestling that I always waited for. And we all had that like bated breath for that moment with like that true, pure, joyous moment. And yeah. If I could be more real and bring that moment more often, then it was kind of like, this is what I'm here to do. And this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I don't think many people would argue that you do it very, very well, whether it was for ECCW, whether it's for Defy Wrestling. Now, I have to ask any status as far as Defy goes, I cannot wait to see them back. You're starting to see promotions like your MLWs, your Warrior Wrestling, some of the other bigger promotions in the world that I think Defy could look at as sort of their peers in the wrestling scheme of things. Where is Defy Wrestling? My heart needs it back. <laughs> oh. Yours and so many others, my friend. Like, I hear that every single day from Defy fans. The Defy is just like clamoring. They just, they're such a, they're family, right? And mm -hmm. for them to be, for us to be like disconnected like this feels so weird. We were able to always like, no matter what was going on in our world, be able to check in for that like once a month or twice a month with each other and escape to the world that we all cherish so much. And mm -hmm. now it's gone. So I, I unfortunately can't give you any update right now. I can't wait to defend my belt. It's uh, like my, my waist is itchy to defend that title. <laughs> um, against something other than the tag team of anxiety and depression, which I fight every single day. Um, so yeah, I can't give you any timeline on that. They're great people who want to do things the safest way possible, which is why they mm -hmm. produce such an amazing product. Absolutely. So I know they're not going to come back until they feel that they can do things the right way. So absolutely. That might be a while. Well, fair enough. And it is, all, it is for all the right reasons, right? But you talk about Defy, unfortunately, not running. Wrestling is coming back slowly but surely to British Columbia. I know that there were some restrictions handed down over the last week that, poof, they're gone again. But is that sort of something you may be looking at, getting in with some of the promotions down there again? Is it that sort of desire for you to get back in the ring, or is it still just playing it safe on your end? Um, yeah, definitely wanting to play things as safe as possible on my end. You know, I don't want to risk my health for wrestling. Yeah. Wait, that doesn't make, I've been doing that my whole career. Um, and here I am, push right over my head. <laughs> no, I don't want to, um, I don't want to go out there and spread anything or I want to be a positive influence as best I can. And right now mm -hmm. I don't think me going out there and sweating in other people's mouths or kissing anyone is going to be happening at any time soon. So as much as I miss wrestling, I'm not going to get back into the ring until there's some sort of like, we've made some steps forward in precautions and, and things like that. Um, I just, yeah. yeah, I don't feel comfortable with it right now, unfortunately. And like every single day I'm like craving it. Like my hips are craving throwing a suplex and I'm practicing yeah. springboarding on everything around my house. And I think, yeah, I've super kicked like 10 house flies out of the air and it's just like, I need it. <laughs> but the longer I go without it, maybe the sooner we can have it full blast, you know? Completely fair, my friend. Does the closure of ECCW have anything to do with that? Or is that just more of a side thing that is what it is? No, that's a good question, too. I think that, yeah, I don't think ECCW would be coming back right now. Like, Vancouver itself has some pretty serious restrictions in it. The stuff mm -hmm. you'll see going on in BC is kind of in outskirts, like some on the island and some, like, in the Kelowna area. But you won't see anything within Vancouver proper. Um, so it seems like the chances of that with the restrictions that they've got would be really, really hard to do. The stand-up shows are lucky enough to be able to happen at like restaurants and stuff like that. So yeah. places that are already have the precautions in place and all of like the plexiglass and all that kind of stuff. So it'd be really hard to find a venue that has all that in place that would fit enough people for wrestling or you can yeah. make that work. So And it's tough enough to monitor a wrestling show at the best of times. Oh, geez. I, yeah, no, I always think that our security <laughs> guards work harder than anyone else. <laughs> Couldn't agree more, man. Like, did you see that clip of Moxley? It was a couple months ago, I think, at All Out and just 
security guard, and I can't remember his name. Somebody tweeted at me, and now I'm that asshole not putting someone over. But just took him out. Like, some of those security guards, man, some professional wrestlers, I've never been scared of one because they seem like the nicest people in the world. But let me tell you, man, there's some bouncers I'm terrified of. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. They, like, if we're talking about mean mugging, bouncers have wrestlers beat at nine out of ten times for sure. Oh, a hundred percent, man. Now we talk about the Island. Let's bring it back here a bit to Alberta because I want to transition over with the fan question from Thaddeus Archer, the third, who I'm sure you encountered a little bit in your time here in Alberta. He just wanted to ask simply who were some of your favorite opponents while you were here in the prairies? Oh, in the prairies. Okay. Well, I was there for quite a long time. So I've had like an opportunity to work with lots of people while they were on their way either through or coming up. Like I was just thinking about a match I had with, uh, uh, Tyson Kidd or TJ Wilson the other day in front of a crowd of four people at the uh, <laughs> old rodeo where Ross Hart was our referee. We were the main event. The match started at 1150 and went to like 1206 or something like that. So the match actually went from one day into the next day. Um, <laughs> it was the main event, but the actual main event of the rodeo was the fireworks. And they were going yep. on at the exact same time as this match. So everyone got up. Speaking of people <laughs> using my, match, my performances, they all got up and they all rushed out to watch the fireworks. Meanwhile, me and uh, Tyson are like giving it all we got. He ended up hurting his knee like three moves into the match. Ross Hart was like coaching us on. You got this, guys. I'm like, you carry it on, you know. I, I, and in the audience, we've got a crowd of Natalia and we've got one – uh, reported that went by the name of, of Slam J and like and then two other random people that were just there to make sure that we didn't destroy the building. We're not fireworks um, fans. <laughs> no, but the match was still great. Like every time I could step into the ring with him, we always had that great connection because we like trained so much together and traveled to, like around to these like local shows and stuff. So yeah, our chemistry was always right on and we were laughing as much because we knew how ridiculous the scenario was but so yeah. that was a great i wrestled christopher daniels for the first time in alberta and that was very like cool super cool that taught me so much that was like early that was the first name i ever worked and mm -hmm. he's just like was such a nice guy and was so professional and like led yeah. me through the match and like definitely pulled my best match up to date at that point out of me yeah, and man. then I've worked with him like three times since, and he's just always been nothing but a class act and one of my favorite people. So he's a guy that like, him. he's a guy you watch on TV and you can see how good he is, but I was lucky enough to go to all in and like, you see that guy work live and holy shit, man, it is mind blowing to some of the shit he can do. For sure. No, just like the little things and how smooth he is and stuff like that. And like I said, backstage's attitude was just super cool. And like, like I said, willing to work with a guy who was like fairly, I wouldn't, I wasn't green at that point. I think I was like, five years in but i was still you know like didn't know what the fuck green comparatively oh for sure like still am and always will be um so that was <laughs> great but like yeah i had a great feud with natalia that was my first ever feud with stampede wrestling they needed somebody to like that was willing to like get german suplexed and power bombed and have all her <laughs> test out all of her like all of her moves on and i was more than willing to eat a million drop kicks or Power, bomb, power bombs or whatever and do my best not to smile while taking them because she was always super fun to work with. We were always on yeah. the same page and just like so funny, so funny. Like some of the moments that we were able to share, whether it be training in the dungeon or, or stampede wrestling matches, it was awesome to like get to work with somebody that like we came up together. So we were able to like, we we're at the we were always giving each other as opponents. So it yeah. just, we like learned so much working together. Her and as well, like uh, Harry Smith, who I had like a lot of encounters with, and he's like just a beast and like was from the moment yeah, I met him man. 14, you know, like him and like, Ch like then the young guys, like people like Chucky Blaze and Brandon Van Danielson and um, yeah, and Alex Plexus, like there was so many, like young lions that were also like so hungry and like through TJ's training and through like dungeon by proxy stuff, they learned they <laughs> just had like this hybrid style that was like still some of like the stuff I think is like unmatched chain wrestling wise and really pushed me to be a better performer while I was training them. Like I was training them and all of a sudden they're way better than me. And then I've got to keep up to them. And 
it was great to just have that like young spirit, you know? Yeah. So I would say like from the young lions to people like Dirty Duke Durango and Bruce Hart, I had like such a great, great opportunities within Calgary and Chris Steele. And yeah, I would, there's great memories for sure. It's kind of like, and I compared it to TJ actually the last time I spoke to him, but it's almost like when you look at the cast of Freaks and Geeks, when you compare it to the Albertan wrestling scene back then, when you're like, holy shit, look at some of the people who are here. You've got Randy Myers, TJ Wilson, Harry Smith. Like, it's insane. Did you guys realize back then, like, just how good that the talent here was? Like, even looking at some of the clips on Matt Rats, how good some of the matches you guys were having were. Like, just, I guess, what a special time it was in Alberta for you. I think it's one of those things that you just, I don't think you ever realize it during the moment. You know what I mean? That like, you always hear that like the, the people who made it to these gigantic places, whether that be in wrestling or whatever entertainment field or any field, they always talk about the like growing up times and those moments where like, they were like first cutting their teeth and getting their teeth cutting through their tongues or whatever in this case, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just those opening days. Like we, I remember riding in the ring truck to horrible shows with, brutal draws with like Tyson Kidd and Harry Smith and uh, Apocalypse was later Rick Victor and Natalia's in the back or me and Natalia are in the back of this ring truck that's like running out of gas or something like that and got Ross Hart on the cell phone convincing us that we can like well just keep going you know I'm like we're out of gas and he's just convincing us <laughs> these moments that like you can never like you don't realize how great they are till you look back they maybe make better mm -hmm. stories than they do in the moment but yeah it was a who's who and we knew it like there was you asked if like i did at least like i being an unathletic kid who was like just trying to grip onto anything and i was just watching these people that were like head and shoulders beyond anything else i had ever seen and still in some degrees have ever seen professional wrestling wise and the through the determination and again through that years of like filtering through whether it comes from Stu, then it comes down to like to Brett and then it comes down to Harry, you know what I mean? And all that's yeah. kind of like, kind of congealed down. Like if you're making like uh, caramel or something like that, you know, and it becomes <laughs> its strongest form. Yeah. And so there was just so much of that going on that we knew there was something special and there was no yeah. doubt that these people were going to be stars. I love and the phrase dungeon by like proxy. Out, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if I could be there by proxy, well, yeah, I'm good. Cool. <laughs> Man, it's pretty cool. And like you go through your resume and the amount of people that have trained you and you've trained subsequently, like there's almost Myers by proxy at this point, man. But I do want to ask you because it was something that I always, you know, I find myself watching when I've got nothing else to do. It's one of my favorite experiences in professional wrestling. I want to talk to you a little bit about World of Hurt because watching that versus chatting with you right now, it seems like there's a lot of you know, very much same, but very much different for lack of a better way to put it. So just take me through your experience with World of Hurt. Like how does something like that come about where you end up training with Rowdy Roddy Piper for a TV show? Okay, well, it came out of me being a bitter asshole for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, there was All a, the best the first, stories start this way. <laughs> right? So the first, the first season was, oh, Lance, uh, was Lance Storm. He hosted yeah. the first and coached the first season. And they held their big show, like their like filming of all the matches they were going to have at a PWA show, which I had been, you know, felt like I was, that was like my show. And like, I worked hard to like make this show what it was. And that was just ego. And obviously all wrestling is a, it's like a circus. We need everybody from like the popcorn seller to people putting up the ring to the promoter and all that. Yeah. And at this show, um, they had, but our show, the PWA show was beforehand. Was, okay. Uh, and then the Lance Storm show was more of the main event show. So we were all kind of treated as like dark matches. Yeah. And I felt like I've been wrestling in this town longer than any of these people that is on this Lance Storm World of Hurt show. Who do these people <laughs> think they are coming into my town and taking over my show? Not my show, but I thought it was. So then they had footage of me setting up the ring because that's what we all did. We all came and set up the ring and the world yeah. of people came over to me. They had another dressing room too, which don't get me started on that, but they came up to me and then they had me, um, they asked me if they could, I would fill out this form to, because I was in footage of setting up the ring and they wanted kind of footage of the ring being set up. And I'm like, okay, so I'm not going to be on this show, but you're going to show me like I'm some guy who sets up rings. So I'm yeah. not like, who, don't you know who I am? 
I'm I'm nobody. I'm, but I sure think I'm somebody. Um, so I, I was like, no, I'm not going to sign on to that. You're not going to pay me any for my likeness. Like, I'm not going to do this. You can blur out my face or put a blue dot on it like they do on cops. And they're like, do you have any idea how expensive that is? And I'm like, I don't care. You're not going to pay me. Like, this is. I was going to say it probably costs more than it would to pay me. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So I'm like, I was a, I was a real jerk that night. And then being that it was a reality show, the best way to audition for a reality show is to be a, be a drama queen because then season two comes around and they're like, we need wrestlers to fill out season two. Do you remember that drama? This guy was a dick. (laughs) That was such a dick. There's no way we can't bring him on and he won't stir up so much controversy. So... (laughs) They came to me and I was kind of shocked when they came to me and I was like, okay, this, I don't know about this. Uh, but then as soon as they dropped Piper's name, they like, they had, they knew they had me. Like, I was like, I'm not yeah. gonna, the money wasn't great, but it was like, I, I like put it through my head and I was like, what, how much would I pay to get trained by Piper as opposed, you know what I mean? So I was like, I'm yeah. totally going to do this. I was a little bit walking on eggshells because I knew that like, do these people like me or are they just here to like make me look like an ass? Yeah. But I love looking like an ass. So that always works out anyways. So <laughs> we've got that in common. Don't worry there. There you go. Yeah, all the best <laughs> ones too. Ah, that's so cool, man. Like, and especially getting the opportunity to learn, like you say, from Rowdy Roddy Piper. I don't think anyone can stress just what a cool opportunity that is for anyone. Nonetheless, someone, let's just stress here, Canada's own Rowdy Roddy Piper. <laughs> exactly. No, and he was like an idol of mine growing up. Like he was my guy, like. Yeah. He has that like unique it factor that was like unmatched by anyone else. You couldn't pretend to have that. You know what I mean? It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't trumped up as much as I believe that he um, turned it up. I believe that that was just him and no one, it was like uniquely him and just this energy. And like the first moment I met him, they did like a shocking thing where they were like, okay, we're going to have everyone come into the office here to do like a little interview. And then he was just there. We didn't know he was going to be there. And I think oh, like really? nine cool. out of ten of us, yeah, I think we all cried. I think we all cried. He broke down. He had this way of like staring into your soul and kind of like, yeah, knowing knowing you better than you knew yourself. Mm-hmm. And the lessons I took from that like ten days to two week shooting was like astronomical. He was such a such a kind soul. That was the thing that I took away was like he was everything I wanted Roddy Piper to be, but then a hundred times sweeter, like such a kind maniac, you know what I mean? And like, that's such an inspiration to me because I have such a high energy level and such a high like capability to get big and to get large right away. Um, But the way he was able to have that to be both the kind and the maniac just again is inspirational to me and just showed me that like, obviously he had his demons and he was able to work through them and end up being this kind, sweet man who was willing to teach us all and took us all under his wing and was teaching us meditation tactics as well cool. as he was. Yeah, right. Like he was, yeah, teaching us breathing techniques before our matches and stuff like that and had all sorts of cool things. So he would do like a countdown breathing. So it was like uh, he would have you breathe in to five, like breathe in one, two, three four, five, and then breathe out to five. One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And then again, so it was really great. And just the way he was able to like, you could tell that it was a wild man who was centered. And that was like such a cool opportunity and to feel akin to him. And he was the first one that opened up that sensitive side to me. Like he could tell right away that I had issues with my father, which Mm -hmm. right away, like he looked at me and he said, like, and I'm like, how did you like a psychic or something like that? And uh, that was what broke me down. And then he was like, and just able to be sensitive. It was the first time I showed that again, the vulnerability and the first time to show that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. He brought that out of me and forever. I'll be grateful because that's my, the greatest thing I have. So, I would say that Absolutely. that was definitely, yeah, uh, appreciated and ushered into the world and into the professional wrestling world by Roddy Piper. So, 
I'll be that's so right very now. cool to hear because like you obviously the tricks of television you wonder how much of that sort of stuff is edited but like that was one of the things that struck me too is like you basically walk in that room sit down and he starts bringing up like the issues with the father and all that sort of stuff you're like holy shit roddy <laughs> 100%, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely nuts, man. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I can't ever say that enough. It's always so appreciated that you take the time to hop on because it's not just a cool conversation on pro wrestling, my friend. It's always just such a cool conversation overall. I can't wait to see you back in a wrestling ring sooner rather than later. Whether it's Me with Defy, whether it's with someone here in Alberta, whether it's in Timbuktu and we can catch a stream. However it happens, my friend, I am excited to see it happen. But where can people keep up with the weirdo hero, the punk hunk, ravenous Randy Myers in the meantime so that they can keep up to date with one of the most fabulous professional wrestlers out there in the world today? Oh, shucks, darling. Well, you can find me on Instagram at Weirdo Hero, or you can find me on Facebook at Ravenous Randy. My DMs are always open. I don't really tweet much, but I mean, you can find me at Ravenous Randy on there. Uh, as well as I'm going to be opening up a square store in the next couple of cool. days. So I'm going to have all my merchandise in one place. So just because I'm not doing shows, you can still have an opportunity to grab your favorite weirdo hero stuff and support and show the world that you yourself are a weirdo. And so that would be what I'm plugging right now. I would also plug, there's a, a lovely song out by a friend of mine named Shirley Gnome that is called Love Yourself. That's really a fun take on... Um, kind of mental health and the, the negative thoughts that we give ourselves. So if you could check that out on YouTube, that would be great as well. So yeah, support your very, very cool. and, and just, I, if I could leave you with something, I would just say that like the world is in a, a rough place right now. I, it's important to be gentle on ourselves, but be gentle on ourselves to push ourselves to do a little bit more, not beat ourselves up, but also know that like, we're more than we could ever expect and the power within us once we like find the right way to harness it and what it's meant to do can bring so much to the world i love it man i can't ever close it out better than you can so i will just thank you guys all for tuning into another interview right here on love wrestling stay tuned for the next one i guarantee you'll love it